Welcome to the Dadpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Oliveira. And today I have a very interesting guest who was featured on the 30 Under 30 Forbes list. And she's running a really interesting company in an interesting industry. The cannabis industry is what she caters to. And so I want to welcome our special guest, Stacy Hernowski. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about your journey. You're, you're under 30, so you're a young entrepreneur, which is to me really, really interesting. I started my journey early on as well, um, but I think it's very different today than it was 20 plus years ago, primarily because of the technology. And I think that is your background too, right? Yes. Well, my professional background is actually finance. So I started in investment banking, moved to private equity, and living in San Francisco, um, I saw a lot of um, startups and um, people, you know, le- doing their own thing. And I um, just had the sense like, wow, that's like really interesting. It seems like a really creative way <laughs> to make a living. So I um, left private equity and um, yeah, set out to like start a company. My um, educational background, I do have um, engineering. So yes, I do have a background in technology. Was that something early on when you were in college or when, like, when did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? It wasn't until I think like after like the first, you know, it's really interesting. I think it was like the summer between investment banking and private equity. I'm not sure um, how much listeners know about like iBanking programs for analysts, but you are working so much that there is, um, there's not a lot of time for like, like thought (laughs) or like, like you're so busy focused on like execution, like reflection is not really something that you have time for. So that summer I had like a few weeks off and I just remember, um, like I tried so hard to get this like private equity job. And I like had the feeling like, oh, like, is this, is this actually where, what I want to do? Like, where does my mind go when I, when I'm not forced to do something or I'm not trying to do something because it's like the thing to do. And I, I realized, well, like, you know, what gives me a lot of like energy and what makes me feel creative and inspired is like trying to think of better ways to do things. Um, Like, I just feel like I've developed a proclivity for um, like, if something is annoying or like, (laughs) like time consuming or manual being like, okay, what's like the, what would be a better system for this? And I, I noticed that like trend popping up from doing things like booking party buses to like having to carry my clothes to the gym from the office and like store my dirty clothes under my desk for the day. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I started, I like noticed that I was like starting to think this way and I was getting like excited by thinking about solutions to these problems that I wasn't like encountering. So, um, yeah, that was the, that was like the first inkling I had like, Oh, like if that's like where my mind goes, I probably should be in a profession where like, having like lots of ideas is going to be a real benefit. So startups are a clear (laughs) example, not the only surely, but like a clear example of like where that skill is like, um, can be really like impactful. Right. And it's, it's one of those things, anyone who owns a business small or growing or startup, you know, that it's, you, you have to be a little bit crazy to want to go down that path, you know, and there are safer paths. I talk to a lot of young people and lecture at different colleges and they'll ask me, you know, the ones who are entrepreneurial, which this Gen Z, they are all entrepreneurial, you know, and I say, well, you know, you have lots of paths, but you have to consider different things, right? Like the financial side, like the, like how different is your product? And sometimes if you are just coming into some money, maybe, right, maybe it's an inheritance and you want to run your own business, maybe buying a franchise is a, is a, is an easier way to grow a business. And then down the road, you can go and start your own thing. Because if you don't have something that is unique, which I think Canix is, and we're definitely going to talk about Canix and what you guys are doing there with the software, then it makes it really difficult. Actually, the um, uh, the census, uh, SBA, all these organizations that collect all this data, they consistently report that more than half the businesses that, that go out of business within the first five years, which I think it's like 90 plus percent. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like huge, right? So you're yeah. insane to go into business. More than likely, most of us don't make it. It's just, yeah. a, it's just a statistic, right? But um, 56% of them report and answer on these surveys that the reason they went out of business was because I I thought it was going to be finance, right? Or maybe it's employees. No, it's no product fit. 
Mm. Because people, it's like, I'll build it. They'll come. Not really. Yeah, not you, the case. So, so, so talk to me about canics. What, what, what is it? I know it's seed to sale, which I totally understand because in other industries, there are uh, SaaS platforms that do everything from one end to the other, you know, from the marketing to the CRM inventory, all of that. What does Canix do? So Canix powers the cannabis supply chain. So we are an ERP for the cannabis industry serving cultivators, manufacturers, and distributors. For what, um, for listeners who don't know what ERP stands for, it is um, enterprise resource planning um, software, which is a very vague term um, and it can encompass a lot of different things. Think of it as the foundational software that companies dealing in physical goods use to run their business. So CRM, inventory management, compliance, accounting, costing, valuation, task management, reporting, you name it. Like all those things are generally encompassed within like an ERP system. Even sales, right? Because I, I, I looked on your website and I was astounded that you guys have the sales and the reporting and all of that, that you typically would find in the marketing software, automation software, where you need to integrate and have all the different APIs talk to one another so that you can get down to the bottom line and get back to the CFO and say, okay, we know this is the customer journey. This is how we make money. This is lifetime value. It seems like your software does really a lot of the process from back office to the front office. It it does. Yes, we do encompass sales with and it's really interesting that you bring up front office because our goal with like building an ERP for cannabis. So there's ERPs like for other industries like SAP, Oracle, these are all like ERP systems. But what we really want to do is redefine what it means to be an ERP. There is so much potential for like unleashing creativity by making a lot of um, things like easier. So for example, with sales and like being front of office, we have all of the inventory data for a company on what is going to, what's available to sell and what's not available to sell, sell. So like one thing that we did that I think is not encompassed in a classic ERP system is feed that up to a front end where um, like we can automatically populate what people have available and they can send that around to their customers. So they don't need to be constantly like checking in and like on the phone and calling people and letting people know this is how things are changing. So it's essentially like a Shopify storefront for I was going to, that's yeah. what, that, that was the first thing that came to mind. But what was also interesting for me when I was kind of looking through the website and analyzing your product and, and uh, offerings was that this front end app that you give to these um, uh, all the way down to the farm, right? Starting from the farmer, it, it it can be offline too, right? Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of unique challenges in cannabis. So uh, being offline enabled for data entry is one really key one um, mm -hmm. because a lot of these farms are in areas without good reception or internet. Right. And I noticed that just because I, you know, I, I do a lot of RVing and traveling with my family and it is one big challenge for us. Internet connections. Sometimes we're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and I have to go offline and I try to always make sure that whatever software I'm using, I can use offline and it's not on the cloud because if I have no connection, you know, it might like, for example, the Everglades, we go down to the Everglades, which is like the southernmost point other than Key West that you can go in, in Florida. And when you go in that park, you're 50 miles out from any internet connection, you know? So if we're spending a week out there, I have to make sure everything is working. And so I thought that your, your software and Canix is what, and what they're doing, because as I mentioned to you, I have friends and even some, a cousin of mine who's in the industry, they always talk about that challenge, connectivity, being out there, being out in the open, even, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's why you need, you need something tailor-made essentially for like your, we, we really try to listen to our customers, like specific problems and needs rather than like dreaming up what we think would be cool and like giving that to them. So a lot of our product development is like driven by like customer feedback. So you and your co-founder, when you guys decided to get into the industry, sure, you probably studied, studied it, did the market research. Uh, I'm assuming you went out and visited everyone from the, the farmer to, you know, the dispensaries, everyone in between, right? Down the supply chain. Um, why did you pick that industry? Was there a connection to it for you? 
Uh, actually, I first had my first foray into cannabis was consulting for a company called California Dreamin. Um, they're a THC infused beverage company, and they're they're great. And that was the first time I saw like, oh, a lot of this like inventory management is done manually, um, like tracking your like recipes um, or like your sales management and the systems that are there today when I talked to a few more people in the industry, like the number one thing that I heard as an issue was I want one single source for, of truth for my business. I want one thing and you know, it can have an API. It doesn't have to do everything, but I need something where that will tell me what I have on site, how much I'm making. And I need that connect, like to connect to the state compliance system. I need it to house all my historical inventory data. Cause right now it's like this hodgepodge of like accounting and CRM and Google sheets and, compliance systems and like nothing is really like consolidated in one single source. So um, that it, honestly, at first it was an incredibly daunting task. So we started with compliance because compliance on its own is incredibly time consuming sure. um, because, you know, something interesting is like when we first started, I think we were a little bit nervous to take on such a huge undertaking. I don't, you don't typically see startups doing ERPs and especially for an industry like cannabis, where you have to serve every vertical to really make a great product. Um, and that's because like, you know, you have a small team, there's like a limited amount that you can do and you have to like build all, all these features. Like we have so many features, but I think like eventually we really like about six months in, we realized like, you know, compliance is a big thing, but this is what our customers are telling us if we don't do this, someone else is going to. So that's how we like kind of pivoted from compliance into like full-scale ERP. And how did you, I, I read that you guys went through Y Combinator, right? And you also did the Disrupt Battlefield uh, startup challenge there. Yes. So where did you meet your co-founder? To me, it's always interesting with co-founders um, because I've gone at it alone in many ventures, but I've also had mm -hmm. partners, sometimes multiple partners. And I'm always interested in that story of how you met and, and decided that you would be a good partner. We, we met at a party and it was about a month into, um, it, it was about a month into me uh, consulting and having these ideas for Canix. And I just, um, we got to chatting and I was just telling him like, oh, like, I'm like consulting right now. And like, this is an idea that I'm batting around that I want to like explore. And Artem was like interested in, or like he actually just, he was interested in what I was working on, but then he also made a joke like, well, do you need like a part-time CTO? Because he at the time was like at Facebook, as like a senior engineering manager. And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> You're <laughs> um, the guy. And, and, yeah. And he was like, oh, I was joking. <laughs> um, but uh, no, then we mutually interviewed each other the next week we discovered that we really liked working with each other. I feel so lucky that I went to that party. He is incredibly easy to work with. He's a terrific engineer. He's a great leader. I like, I, I we don't have a classic co-founder story, like where we've been like friends for years or have worked together before, but it's really worked out very well. Now. I, I mean, I feel like we're family now. Yeah, well, I think it, it is it is classic in the ways that the takeaway for young people who are, you know, graduating college and looking to start their own thing is go to parties, oh. right? Go, <laughs> yeah. to, go to a party and make sure that there's, you know, people there who have worked for, you know, big companies like Facebook and uh, <laughs> you, everyone needs a good CTO, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's very hard to find good CTOs. Um it's, it's very, like when I was, I, I initially started like solo because I was like, I, I think it'll be really difficult to find someone that I've, I've like really gel with. And it's such an important decision. Um, it's big. Yeah. <laughs> day in and day out. I know, you know, and I, 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 I always think to myself too, I know that I haven't been the perfect partner for other ventures that I've been in and vice versa. I've in, in certain ventures said, Oh, that partner is getting on my nerves, you know? <laughs> um, but I can definitely count on probably uh, on two, three partnerships I've had where they were long and there was nothing really that I could pick out about that person that annoyed me so much that eventually I'd say no. So you're mm -hmm. lucky that you found him right from the get-go because 
I think for me, it took, you know, it wasn't until I was in my thirties that I found partners that mm -hmm. uh, I gelled with, as you said, you know, so that's really cool. I think it's so important because, you know, when you're starting a company, you seem to be like very operations idea focused and, and the sales you sort of, it, it sounds like you have a lot of different talents, but then if you had to also worry about being the leader in the tech side, you're, it would be much harder for you to grow this business, right? It would be impossible. impossible. <laughs> I don't think I like, I don't think that this particular company, one person could do it alone. There's, there's just so much to think about, like, like building an ERP in like a, a new industry. Like there's like differing legislations in every like territory that we're in, like there, the product feature set really is quite broad. So there's just like so much to keep track of. And, um, yeah. So I'm very grateful that like I have someone and, and also just like your mental state. I mean, it's always good to have a partner and like, you know, we can like when one person is feeling down, the other person can kind of like cheer them up. I've, I've worked on a venture alone before and this, we are moving like 50 times faster <laughs> than when I was working on it alone. Um, it's just, it's a lot to have to manage it solo. Not that I think it's impossible or like entrepreneurs should sure. like, I think it is better to go it alone than with the wrong partner. Totally. Um, but it, once you find that right partner, like it, it really is a relationship that needs to be like really, um, what is the word? Like, like cherished and also like, um, like maintained, like it takes maintained, work. Yeah. Nurtured. Yeah. Nurtured. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it takes time, but I think it also makes you grow as a person, right? Because you have your own ideas and styles of leadership and you're making critical decisions on a daily basis, whether it's employees, vendors, clients, mm -hmm. and to have that other person with the same level of authority to say, actually, yes, or actually, no, that's a terrible idea. Right. Um, it, it makes you grow because sometimes you feel uncomfortable, even if you're not a type A personality, you know, as an entrepreneur, someone telling you your idea sucks or, Hey, no, we're going to have to rethink that one is not, no one feels good about that, but I've been told that many times and it, it's helped me grow because then I'm like, actually, after thinking about it, you're right. That would have been a bad decision. So I'm so glad that you're here next to me to guide us into the right place and, and vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's partnerships can be very, very good. If you find the right person, if not, you're right, go out alone. Yes. And so, you will build mental fortitude going at it alone, for sure. <laughs> that's true, too, for yeah. sure. What about how do you like living in San Francisco? And as, I mean, it's like startup world where you are, you know, so there are so many startups, so many companies between there, Silicon Valley, like, what's the atmosphere like? Tell us because like, everyone, I mean, I've been out there plenty of times, but it's very different than if you live and work there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I'm going to just give a very honest answer. Like, I think when I was like, not when I was like first starting out and I was um, like, like first starting out and not getting a lot of like traction on my like initial ideas, I was incredibly intimidated by the amount of startups I was running into. I was like, oh my gosh, everyone has so much traction. Everyone seems to know what they're doing. They've like worked at these companies, like these tech companies, you know what it's like to be in tech. And so I was like, I felt a bit like I was like in a pressure cooker and was like constantly comparing myself to like others around me. So I actually left San Francisco for six months to go live in Bali and like try and start a startup, um, like start my company from there. So that was really interesting. It wasn't, I mean, I also wanted to go to Bali. It wasn't, I wasn't just <laughs> escaping, but I did, I do think like at first I was kind of like intimidated by the amount of startups that I saw. And I was also just had a very naive on like view on startups. I was like, oh my gosh, like so many people, someone's going to have my idea and then I'm not going to be able to do it. But, but now I feel like now that I've like had more experience, like Canix has been around for two years. Um, I mean, I love being around other startups. I feel like there's a lot to learn. Like I love meeting people and talking about their companies um, with them. I've like invested in a few startups. So um, I feel like I've come to like really embrace it and also just like have a more real realistic view on um, like what it takes to run a startup. Like, it's really like, there's so many different ideas out there, even like, even with everyone in little, wait, what seems like everyone in San Francisco starting a company. Um, it's highly unlikely that you're going to run into someone doing the same thing as you in the same way. So yeah, I think it's really like, 
it's a really fun place to be. Like if you have like growth mindset and like the attitude and honestly, like the attitude of like, oh, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to compete with everyone I meet and try and like, <laughs> and like, I'm going to try to learn from them and um, be humble and like, accept that they know things that I don't know. Then I think it becomes like a very interesting and inspiring place to be. Yeah, totally. And I, and I can, you know, kind of identify with that because even early on, I'd go to conferences around the globe and, and certainly San Francisco and you, I'd go with my little company and you do feel like, Hey, wait a minute, there's 10,000 other companies there. I'm like, no one. And you're right. The sooner as an entrepreneur, the sooner you can just stop comparing yourself to anyone else and just stick to your mission, to what you're doing, the, it, it just makes you much happier not to even with your competitors, because everyone in any industry, you're going to do that. You're going to benchmark yourself against the bit, the bigger guys, the guys who are mm -hmm. already, but it doesn't really do you any good to dwell on the fact that they have market dominance or this market share for me over the years, I learned from other mentors was just like, listen, you know, what your plan is, what your goal is. That's it. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what anybody else is doing. And, and that, that for me was a, a, an easier way to get out to conferences and not worry that if I had a small booth, you know, and then like my biggest competitors got like 50 people, the biggest booth, who cares, right? I have right. something to offer that they don't, which is why I have clients that they don't, that makes right. them unique. And I know you guys are into the tune of over 200 clients now. 400 actually 400 wow <laughs> i had read not too long ago 200 and change but that is phenomenal in two years you guys have acquired that many customers thank you yeah i'm really proud of our growth i think we like the decision that we made to like focus on product and like double down on engineering was and and also just like listen to our customers very closely i i definitely attribute that to like our growth because we're at the point now where we get on a demo and people are like, I cannot believe you guys built this. It looks exactly like the Google sheet that I'm doing manually. So um, yeah, I think just like deep listening to someone's problems and honestly, not a lot of talking. <laughs> like one value that we have at Canix is like remarkable listening because generally like you have so much more to learn like for, from, from your customer than to try and pontificate at them like how great the product is. And I, I think people can see that like, okay, we're like listening to them. We've incorporated that in the product and we're like continuing to do that. Like we, we are still very much focused on product and the team is largely engineers. Wow. No, that's awesome. I love that. Cause for me, again, I've been in the lead gen side of the business here with Predict, and, and um, I always just, I, th I don't think of it as leads you know, I work with sales teams all over the country, small to large companies. And with sales teams, sometimes it's tough because if they're just focused on sales and back to what you said, they're not really listening to the customer. Mm -hmm. I, I always try to remind them of the, the greatest examples of the, the best companies out there, right? That not only have a great story, great product, but they also have teams of people who really care. And to mm -hmm. your point that just listen, because you can't just always be selling always be selling. No, you, you have to take a step back and let the client tell you what their challenges are and say, okay, well, this is how I think I can solve it or not. Or I'll give you an example, actually, that comes to mind, something that happened yesterday and today. I have a client who said, Hey, I think I need a fractional CMO. Mm. And I said, okay, oh, no, not CMO, CFO. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You needed a, a financial officer. And I said, okay, I, I have the person, a, a, an accounting firm. They're small, but they specialize in fractional C, CFO services. Mm -hmm. So I did the introduction, you know, the thing that you do and said, this is my client. So make sure you take good care of them. I know you guys are good. So they had a conversation a few weeks ago. And then yesterday, when I spoke to my client, he said, Hey, before we get off the call, I want to tell you about the, the uh, Harris and the guy that you uh, introduced me to the accounting firm. I, I said, Oh, mm -hmm. did you hire them? The CFO says, no, I didn't hire them because actually they, they did a review and whatnot and said, you actually don't need a fractional CFO right now. Here's what you can do. Dot, dot, dot. But it wasn't going to cost them anything. What they were, the advice they were giving them. Mm -hmm. And then this morning I happened to be on the call with the, uh, the guys from the accounting firm and they said, Oh, Hey, we took care of your client. We, we sat with them. Um, but really he doesn't need a fractional CFO right now. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought like, no one made money. There was no transaction, but it was about <laughs> the listening, which is what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I always think like the best demos are really conversations where like, yeah, instead of like a presentation to someone. So one thing that I, I still have a big challenge with, and I think most companies do, and it never gets easier as an entrepreneur or leader is hiring and training people, right? Even if you have a great culture, a great product, you're growing. What, like, are you finding it difficult? Because it's a part of our conversation every day with clients, right? There's 10 million jobs out there. People don't want to work. Are you finding, number one, are you finding it hard to, to find people, attract people to work? And number two, what do you find most difficult about hiring and training people? Uh, great question. I mean, it's always difficult to hire engineers, but we, I don't think, I think we're in a pretty unique spot. Um, we have been lucky to, um, I guess, gain a lot of like external clout with like disrupt and like, um, like YC and a lot of things that are like recognized in the startup world. So we have like, I, I do feel like pretty confident about our ability to attract engineers, um, but it's just like, there's not enough of them in, in general. <laughs> so like, it, it does take a while to make sure that they're the right fit. Um, hiring in other positions, to be honest, hasn't been as difficult, but in terms of training, onboarding is the like a huge like onboarding in other position in, in every position is definitely like our biggest hurdle because the product is well, there's so much to learn about the cannabis industry and its regulations, which you need to understand to really help our customers. And then our product is enormous. <laughs> like there's so many features to understand. Um, and like no like little intricacies about like like okay, this is a shortcut and this is your old way of doing it. And this is your new way of doing it. So actually everyone who's customer facing, we try to make sure has like a product, good product sense, because if you don't, it's going to be really difficult. <laughs> like there's just so much to learn about, about the product. Um, yeah. So it's just like a lot of information to like absorb. So we try to have like a month long onboarding period where there's like shadowing and we, the, the biggest learning that we had this year was like, we need to split up the onboarding as if it were a course and being like, this week we're going to do cultivation and this week we're going to do accounting and this week we're going to do like sales. And, um, and then like everything that you do in that week will be shadowing sales calls or like tests with different members of the team on like how the product works in terms of sales. So that was the biggest change that we made in our onboarding this year. And it's made a tremendous difference because at first we we're like, okay, just shadow everybody on like every demo. And people were like, I don't know where to start or like what I should be focusing on. And it was just, um, not effective. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's kind of the way that we go about that. That's awesome. But I, I you're right about, you know, the, what, whether it's YC or disrupt when you, when your company is growing, if you're able to get sort of on the map where it, it's just, or accolades, awards or anything, like that. Um, I tell people who start startups, you know, focus on those things, which sometimes it's PR driven um, because th sometimes that's what the talent is interested in, right? They want to go work for a company that is exciting and making the news and things like that. So that being said, talk to me about Y Combinator. I know I, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs that are not uh, uh, familiar with them. And I know you guys had a, a, a round where you raised some money there, which is also another topic that I get from, you know, first stage entrepreneurs. How, where, where do I get the money? <laughs> yeah. So YC, Living in San Francisco, I feel like everybody knows YC. It's just like part of like this, his, like the history of the city. So Artem and I were both familiar with it. Like we had friends that had done YC. We'd heard amazing things about it. Um, and so we, we had the, like when we were first starting, we were like, we want to get into YC because like, we're both like really, I had done some like projects before, but like effectively like first time like entrepreneurs. And we thought like the training of YC would be invaluable. So went through like the application process. It is quite intensive. Um, like there's just a long application and a video and then a um, interview. Not that that should dissuade anyone from doing it. I highly recommend the program. <laughs> and honestly, even doing the application like helps you so like helps really frame your thinking and lets you know like, okay, these are the questions that anyone in the industry is going to be asking you, whether that's a journalist or an investor or customer. So you need to have good answers to them. So I think that 
the application part is um, like really helpful no matter what. And yeah, so um, we went through the program. We raised uh, 1.5 million afterwards. And then um, last year in October, we did TechCrunch Disrupt and we were uh, the winner, which we were really excited about. So awesome. uh, we raised Congrats. another, thank you. Yeah, we raised another round of 2.5 from like momentum off of that. So wow. um, yeah, now we're, we're excited <laughs> like to put that now you money can just. Use. Yeah. yeah. Now you can just focus on spending it yeah. <laughs> or, or investing it. No, really right. investing it. And I, but that's unique. And I, I think your story is unique for that for multiple reasons. A, you're young. B, you're in an interesting, you know, industry cannabis. You know, I have friends that talk to me about the issues with pay, compliance, like you mentioned, but also payments. Yes. You know, pay, payments has been very tough, whether it's Stripe or whatever else you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting industry, not only because it's new, but because I think Congress lawmakers, they, they don't really know, uh, you know, how to handle it. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. cryptocurrency. People yeah. are still trying to figure out like, oh, man, all these new companies, technologies, how do we get a handle on it? So it's it's kind of cool. It's a it's a cool it's got an edge to it, right? Yeah, it's definitely a new industry, which shows in some of the operational and regulatory difficulties that like companies run into We're we don't have as many regulatory issues because we're not plant touching. But even so, like operationally, like there are certain payment processors that we can't use because they consider us like an ancillary cannabis company or mm -hmm. bank accounts or um yeah, just a lot of like little annoyances <laughs> like that make it like harder. But I also think like that's why there's op an opportunity right now because it is new. So those are the things that we're willing to, to kind of work through. Right. Well, Stacy, I really appreciate you taking the time for, you know, making time to talk to us and share your story. It's an interesting story. And I, again, want to congratulate you and Artem and the team at Canix and all that you guys are doing is really interesting. I'm going to post all your links in the show notes, but if people want to connect with you or find out more about what you guys are doing, where should they go? Yeah. So Canix.com is our company website. You can find out more about Canix from there. Um, and then uh, I'm on LinkedIn at Stacy Hernoski. All right, Stacy. Well, I'll let you get back to work and the, <laughs> fix the phone booth and all the things that you guys are doing there in San Francisco. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.